What's going on, everybody? Good evening. What's going on, Spike? Welcome in, Aaron. Good to see you again, Johnny. Welcome in, everybody. We're going to get this going in, uh, of course, Husky's here. Thanks for coming, Husky. Happy to always see you in here. Byron, welcome in. Good to see you. Happy to hear that, Walter. I'm uh, I'm really excited for this one too. Uh, I'm gonna refrain from giving any details until we officially get started because I have it all built into the presentation. But um, this is gonna be a good one. This is um, some of you who have been to some of my kind of more formal lectures in the past generally know how these run. And uh, yeah, I guarantee you won't be disappointed by this series. It's uh, I'm I'm very excited for it and I've been looking forward to it for a long time and finally got the opportunity to make it happen. So looking forward to it. Welcome in everybody. We're gonna get started here in just a couple of minutes. Just gonna give everybody the chance to hop on in. We'll probably get going uh, in about three more minutes, three to four more minutes. So yeah, in the meantime, how's everybody's day going so far? Days, weeks, definitely been uh, quite the week in markets. There's uh, no denying that. You got the queues closing above 500 now. That was a big one. Um, SMP just moving higher, really no way. Uh, this thing's gonna turn around at this rate. <laughs> Um, yeah, definitely been a good week. I seem like Flips had a good week in voice chat with some of you, so that's good to see. All right, Walter, very nice. What's going on, Ant? Welcome in. Uh, all right, a couple more minutes, we'll get going. Any questions, comments before we get into uh, the content for the evening? Quick glance at QCOM. Sure, Al Brooks, just for you. I was looking at that a couple weeks ago and didn't end up doing anything about it. Yeah, around this 200, it was looking interesting. I mean, it doesn't look bad. These daily bars are certainly not the most, not the strongest, um, but let's take a look. If you look at the hourly, uh, this is certainly tradable, right? Clearly that 209 spot is uh, one of interest there. So if I wanted to trade it, I'd probably be above uh, 209. You could even, if you really wanted to draw some kind of zone like that, but it looks okay above 209. Um, I'm a little bit more partial to some of the semi names that are a bit stronger at this point. So that's gonna be kind of like our MU a little bit. Well, I mean, I guess in terms of overall performance relative to KubeCom, about the same. But I was watching MU. I think I gave the trade idea out back here. Uh, obviously, came back down to retrace the support. But I'd be interested to see it fill this gap above the 137s. Uh, Marvell, one we were watching yesterday. That one's kind of holding up nice still. Uh, got that failed breakout yesterday, which was a bit unfortunate. But um, trying to firm back up here around this trend. Uh, let's see. NVIDIA, I mean, goes without saying, right? AMD, I think also goes without saying. Um, Dell, a little bit weaker than I'd hope, but um, also holding above this trend today could definitely provide us a nice opportunity into tomorrow. So uh, mainly focus on the semi names um, still, but um, yeah, I unfortunately actually won't be able to trade tomorrow. I'm, I'm busy all day, so <laughs> nothing for me, but I'm gonna try and get some charts out um, for Friday. All right, I'm gonna send one more message out to everybody and we're gonna get going. So just give me one moment here. Uh, starting. What's up, 1K? Good to see you. Thanks for coming, dude. What's my favorite song at the moment? Um, been listening to No Sleep by Wiz Khalifa a lot. Uh, a lot of house music too, a bunch of random house music. Um, will this be specifically volume for TOS desktop or is it for all platforms? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Uh, this lecture, I have a slide specifically on this, but um, this 
series, I'll say, uh, applies to any equity, any charting software. It's agnostic. It, as long as it's related to the market, uh, it's important. So, uh, yeah, old whiz, old whiz is the best. A little bit of uh, something like, what's that album called? I think it's Taylor Alderdice. That's my favorite. All right. Um, so, yeah. Welcome in everybody. Um, welcome to the lecture for the evening. I know we got a couple new members, so I'll take a quick moment to just introduce myself. Um, my name is Tosi. Uh, I've been giving lectures here and only options for going on uh, three and a half years, I think it's been. Um, somebody can feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah, I started in January 21. So yeah, three and a half years of lecture. So a little bit of experience under my belt doing this. So hopefully you guys uh, notice the quality that we can provide in these classes. Um, yeah, uh, tonight, really, uh, not going to really talk about myself much because I'm not super important, but big idea uh, is we're going to be discussing in detail volume price analysis, and it's going to be a six lecture series. Uh, so there's going to be a total of one to five weeks, I think, because I'm skipping next week. So anyway, six lecture series. I'm um, going to talk a little bit more about the schedule uh, in the next couple slides, but just a couple things to cover before we get started. With any of my personal PowerPoint classes, uh, generally what I like to do is structure them similar to what I'd consider to be a, a college type of course, where it's structured, there's kind of room for discussion, questions, and the lectures build on each other as we move throughout the series. So hopefully you notice that structure, hopefully you appreciate it. Um, also, uh, in general, my lectures start with some more kind of fundamental concepts, and as we build throughout just the one hour lecture period, those concepts build on each other and hopefully get more complex. So throughout the period of this class, we're going to be spending an hour together tonight. Uh, I couldn't suggest more asking questions, getting things clarified. Uh, if you have a question, I guarantee somebody else has the same thing. So there's no such thing as a stupid question. So any questions, throw them in the chat. If I miss it, go ahead, throw it again. Uh, on the chat sometimes moves pretty quick. So hard for me to catch everything. Um, but yeah, that's really the big idea. I think that's enough of the intro. Uh, let's get right into it and talk a little bit about what the next few weeks are going to look like as it pertains to this course. So let's introduce uh, the topics that we're going to cover as it relates to volume price analysis. I understand that everybody probably doesn't know what these first three words mean yet. Uh, which we will get there, I promise. We're literally starting from the ground up. So if you know nothing, uh, I guarantee you're gonna be okay. So let's talk about our schedule. Uh, class number one is going to be the introduction, which we are all here now. Class number two is going to be the foundations of volume price analysis. So I'm gonna give you a couple kind of hints and starting information as it relates to this class today. Um, but we're gonna go in detail in that second class on really talking about the foundational concepts. Uh, number or class three is going to be talking about applications. So we're really going to be taking the next step in applying what we learned in class two and starting to uh, take uh, that knowledge to real price charts. Uh, number four is thinking about some more advanced concepts. So just building on those foundations and adding a little bit more. Number five is going to be trading strategy. So talking about how to actually use this to structure trade plans, trade ideas, entries, exits, uh, et cetera. And then finally, uh, we're going to end with a conclusion, which this is going to be a different type of lecture. I plan on having this like some kind of workshop, which I don't really know what this is going to look like yet, but I really want this to be more of an open discussion, uh, kind of have everybody talking like it's just voice chat, right? So talk through what we've learned, the questions that we have, bring some different examples to that class, get things reviewed, uh, and really use that as a check of our understanding. So anyway, that's the six classes. Uh, I plan on getting some kind of calendar posted so that you could kind of schedule these all out on your own calendar so you know uh, you know, when you need to be here because all these lectures are included in your membership. So you don't have to pay any extra to get here. Uh, it's not gonna cover anything similar to the mastermind as far as I know. So still gonna be kind of separate, but yeah, uh, let's talk a couple of goals and outcomes for this lecture series. So I got two main goals for you all. Uh, number one is to develop you all into successful traders who have a clear understanding of the fundamental principles of volume price analysis. This should be pretty self-explanatory. As you go through these six lectures, I really want you to understand everything we talked about, which is gonna be volume price analysis. So that's goal number one. Goal number two is to teach you all how to apply the techniques of volume price analysis to help you create and build on top of your existing trading system so the big idea is that um, really what the concepts that we talked about in these lectures aren't necessarily something that you have to use standalone, um, void of any other sort of trading strategy or technical analysis. This can be something that you use in some kind of standalone format. However, really, I want you to all have the tools uh, and knowledge in order to look at charts uh, through the lens that we talk about in the next six lectures and really have this newfound 
information and appreciation for volume and how it can really give us some high quality and important information as it relates to price. So again, understand it being pretty vague, but um, we're going to cover all the details throughout this class. So have no fear. That said, before we get started, does anybody have any questions, comments, concerns, anything else? Or does everybody feel good and just want me to shut up and uh, start going? Cool. All right. Let's get into it, everybody. So for starters, we're going to answer the question, what is volume price analysis? Because obviously, some of you might have absolutely no idea what these terms mean. Uh, and you just kind of showed up this lecture and hope what I told you in the announcement is true. So let's talk a little bit about what volume price analysis actually is. And I have kind of two definitions. So this first one, volume price analysis is a trading technique that combines the analysis of volume and price movements to understand market trends and predict future price actions. And to me, that definition was a little bit vague. So expanding on that just a bit more, by examining the relationship between volume, which is the number of shares or contracts traded, and price, which is the market value of the asset, traders can identify the strength or weakness of price movements, potential reversals, and continuation patterns. As you can imagine, this is super, super important stuff. Uh, volume at the end of the day is what moves financial markets and assets in financial markets. And as a result, the better of an understanding we have in terms of recognizing patterns, understanding how to know what matters and how to know what's noise is only going to make us stronger traders. So really important stuff that we're going to cover in this class. Again, as we continue to go throughout the course, we're going to learn more and more about what volume price analysis is, what the specific techniques are that we're going to apply. Um, but yeah, this is really the big idea. So before I get going, I would be doing all of you a disservice if I act like this is something that I created entirely on my own. A decent chunk of what we talk about is all things that are covered in this book. Um, I'm just going to make it clear in no way am I sponsored by the author of this book and no way do I get any money by making these lectures and shouting out this book. It's, in my opinion, just the right thing to do. So this book is called A Complete Guide to Volume Price Analysis. It's like $20 written by Anna Cooling, a uh, really great trader, um, learned a lot from uh, some of the more larger significant historical traders. So a um, lot, lot of really high quality information here. The book can be, you know, there's some typos in there. It's not perfectly polished, um, but this is where I got all the information from. Well, not all of it, but a decent chunk of the information. So got to shout this book out. If you like what we learn in these classes, feel free to go read the book as well. Um, ideally, these classes cover in much more detail what's talked about in the book and hopefully in a better way, but can't, can't move on without shouting out this book. All right, uh, that's enough of the overhead. Let's start getting into the content. So a couple of things that we're gonna cover throughout this class. We're gonna start with some background though. Like I mentioned, we are really gonna start this lecture series from the ground up. So we're gonna start with a little bit of a history lesson. So I'm gonna teach you guys something that probably most of you had no idea about financial markets and how it all worked when it first got started. So moving to the beginning of when really financial markets first started to move towards becoming computerized. Um, the fundamentals of volume price analysis were created over a hundred years ago, utilizing what is called the ticker tape. And you can see the ticker tape on the right here. Um, and this is what our, I don't wanna say ancestors, but traders before us had to use to determine what a stock was trading at. And you can see here, uh, up top is a ticker. So this looks like PR. And on the second level, you have the volume or lots traded. So this could be 200 shares traded or 20,000 shares traded and the price they traded at. And then the next episode, or the next entry what looks like SF. Uh, and you can see this SF stock traded at 64 and a quarter. Uh, this stock IN traded at $7 and three quarters. So this was how you used to figure out what a stock was trading at is reading this ticker tape and traders years before us would look at this ticker tape and determine how aggressively people were buying or selling the stock just by determining the frequency of how quickly price was moving. And this wasn't really, we didn't just move directly from this to computers. The ticker tape is where it all really began in terms of the first step to computerization. Then we kind of moved through some intermediaries, ultimately to the stock exchange, which I'm sure some of you have seen pictures of a stock exchange where there's a bunch of dudes throwing papers on the NYSE. They're yelling, they're screaming, which you can imagine is another way to determine 
how aggressive people are in terms of buying and selling, right? You know, people want to buy a stock if they're yelling loud about it. It's pretty obvious. So this is really where volume price analysis began over a hundred years ago. And the most important thing to highlight about this that's bigger than these concepts is that there is truly nothing new in trading. Almost everything that we see in financial markets has happened at least once before. There's always going to be things that are new. Like, for example, the whole GameStop situation, that was, you know, probably a new thing. Um, but for the most part, we've seen bear markets. We've seen bull markets. We've seen crazy catalysts. At the end of the day, there's nothing really new in markets. Everything's happened in some way, shape or form before. So that's really the larger concept here. So moving on to today, obviously, none of us here are using the ticker tape, right? We now have real time price charts with millisecond actually accuracy showing us exact prices and volumes and this was the one minute chart uh from spy from just a couple days ago and you could see obviously this is nothing compared to what how trading really started in terms of getting computerized on the ticker tape right there, there's really no way to compare where you have millisecond accuracy showing the volume in every tick every minute every day um, on a computer screen that anybody can access. So things have really changed a lot, but it's important to know that the concepts of volume price analysis are not new. This isn't something that was created once we got access to these charts. It was really realized um, and I'll say consolidated once we got to these kind of more computerized charts, but this is not anything new. This has been around for at least a hundred years. So um, as I mentioned earlier, as somebody asked, you know, what, how do you apply volume price analysis or what does it apply to? Uh, so I wanna let you guys know, the concepts in this course series are only applicable to the following stocks. Just kidding, right? <laughs> As I mentioned before, and how, that was way cheesier than, it's, than I thought when I was writing this. Um, <laughs> so the concepts in this course series are applicable to every stock on every time frame for every type of trader. There's zero limitations for where volume price analysis works. If something trades with volume, if something has a price that's reflected on a chart, you can use volume price analysis. Now, obviously, you know, there's always gonna be edge cases that you can find. Like for example, can you use volume price analysis on the PS4 resale market? Probably not, right? Probably not. But I'll say any asset on the financial marketplace trading in a public stock exchange you can likely apply volume price analysis again on any time frame for every stock for any type of trader and this is really the power of volume price analysis and technical analysis in general right there's really no limits there's no bounds to it it's not like i can only use this on tech stocks or i can only use this on apple or only on the s p it works on anything and everything so yeah <laughs> that was a really corny way to say that but hopefully that answers um the question that was asked earlier in the chat was, you know does this work on all types of brokerages yes the brokerage has zero relevance to if volume price analysis works so wanted to introduce that so let's let's continue on um i'll take a quick pause for any questions if anything comes up in the chat i know husky seemed to like that introduction sorry husky if that was a little too corny but um yeah how are we feeling so far everything making sense Awesome. 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 Cool. How's the, how's the lecture feeling? This is literally the first time anybody's seen this PowerPoint beside of me. So, I mean, is it making sense so far? I, in my opinion, this has been the corniest, corniest part. So cool. Thanks, Walter. All right, let's keep this going. Uh, so just a little bit more background. I feel like I'd be do doing everybody a disservice without introducing exactly what's going on here. Uh, let's talk just a quick, just a quick reminder or introduction into candlesticks. Um, some of you have probably seen this before. Some of you have probably heard this information before, so it's redundant. But if you've never seen a candlestick before, here are kind of some of the basic terms that I'm going to be using as part of this lecture series. So here we have a green candlestick, which sometimes is referred to as a bull candlestick. Uh, you can sometimes hear a candlestick referred to as a bar. Um, there's a bunch of different synonymous terms for candlesticks, but ultimately this is a green candlestick where price has increased. So a couple terms that you're probably commonly going to hear. You have the open of the candlestick, the close of the candlestick, and the high and low. The open is where the period began. So whatever the kind of price level that the candlestick opened at. The close is where the, the candlestick closed at during that time frame. And then you have a high and low. So the high and low of that time frame. And we can just look at a real chart real quick. For example, Dell, right? Uh, let's try and find a good bar here, right? So this green bar here opened at uh, about 140. 
It closed at about 149. It had a high of about 150 and a low of about 138. And it also says all those metrics up here as well. So um, that's kind of just a quick description of a green candlestick. Uh, another kind of way you'll commonly hear this area between the open and close referred to as is the body of the candlestick. Uh, sometimes you'll also hear the spread of a candlestick. All these terms are pretty much synonymous. And then also you have the, oops, you have the wicks, right? So that's kind of why it's called the candlestick. You have the body of the candlestick, which you could think of as the wax, I guess, and the wick of the candlestick, which you could think of, you know, what burns. I guess that's why they called everything the way they did. But anyway, um, this is kind of the basics of a candlestick. These are some of the terms that you're going to hear me use throughout this lecture series. And then conversely, we have a bearish candlestick or a red candlestick or a bear bar, right? They're all really the same thing where the open is above the close, meaning that the price has decreased throughout the time period. So price started higher than it ended in the given time frame. However, the highs and lows are still represented in the same way. So we could look at a red candlestick. For example, this bar here opened at about 179 and it closed at about 170. So there was a $9 drop in price throughout this period. Um, moving on, something that I actually haven't shown in a lecture before is this diagram, which this is actually a screenshot taken from the book. Uh, so one thing that I want to highlight is depending on the time frame of candlestick you're looking at, you can actually think of one candlestick representing a bunch more candlesticks. So this on the left would be kind of a short term representation, and this on the right would be a longer term representation. And just to clarify a little bit, think of this as a five minute chart where you have the opening price where price starts at at the beginning of the day. The low is created somewhere during the day. The high is created somewhere during the day. And the close price is where the price ended for the day. And that is reflected also in the daily candle as something that looks like this, where the open is here, lining up with the opening price. The close is here, lining up with the closing price. And the highs and lows are just wicks. And I can even show you that from today, right? For example, if you take a look at SPY, You can see the open price of about 557, the close price of about 561.40. And if we go and look at the five minute, we can see how we got there, right? Open price of about 557 and close price of about 561.25 to be more accurate. So, uh, and just to give you the side by side comparison, this is kind of the significance of the higher time frame charts and maybe just presented in a way that I've never done it before, which glad you're, you're recognizing that, Walter. Uh, this is the significance of the higher time frame charts, right? Because now you understand the reason why these higher time frame charts are more significant because this one candle on the daily chart represents, I think, a hundred something candles, maybe. Uh, let me, let's think about that seven hours, 30, I, I'm not doing that math right now, but it's like 60 bars, I think, throughout the day, probably something like that. So five candlesticks on the, or <laughs> candlesticks on the five minute are all represented by this single daily candle. And same thing with the hourly chart, right? Each one of these candles represent one hour of price action. It's all represented in the daily bar. So that's exactly what this graphic is represented or representing. Uh, Johnny says, off topic question, is it better to place body levels on bodies or wicks? The short answer is it depends. Um, the longer answer is I tend to find myself uh, placing like entries off wicks and profit, profit targets closer to bodies. But uh, we'll have to dig into that a lot more than that. All right. Uh, so let's go into a couple examples of this. So here, same thing that we talked about, right? This is the S&P 500 from, uh, I think, last Friday, where the five minute time frame here shows each candle, which represents five minutes of trading activity. So the trading day starts at 6.30 Pacific or 9.30 Eastern. And throughout the day, each one of these bars represents five minutes in time. Where, when we go to the daily chart, now each one of these candles represents one day. So you can think of each one of these daily candles as containing hundreds of five minute candles throughout that daily bar. So it takes a long time to form these higher time frame candlesticks. Uh, and I really just wanna get this point across that, um, it's not so simple as just seeing the daily candle and that's the end of it, right? There's a little bit more that goes into it and reasons why the patterns that we see in these daily bars actually matter um, because all it is is representing what happened on the lower time frames. It's all showing the same information, just pre presented slightly differently. All right, let's keep it going. So again, here, this is the single candle right here on the daily chart that represents all of this five minute price action, which, you know, just by looking at a couple PowerPoint slides, it might not be so obvious, but Here's the five minute chart representing what looks like a bunch of price action, but then when we zoom out to the daily, it's much simpler, right? It's a single bar, single amount of volume, it's 
pretty easy to understand, right? So that's really the introduction or the end of the introduction um, to get us all on the same page in terms of what we're looking at based on price, what we're looking at based on volume, or not really volume, but how, how to understand candles, how to understand just basics of price charts. Everybody with me so far, again, if you're not, now's the time to ask questions. I guarantee somebody else has the same question. So quick pause for any questions if you have them. There are 78 five minute candles per trading day. Okay, yeah, I'll take your word for it. Cool, all right, everybody's good. All right, we'll keep it going. If everybody's good, that's great. But don't hesitate to ask any questions if they come up, happy to answer them. All right, so let's start with the fundamental concepts of volume price analysis. This is what I like to call the laws of volume price analysis. And these are gonna be what really guide our thinking throughout the rest of this lecture series and also hopefully our trading careers if we decide to continue to apply these concepts. These laws are pretty much taken directly from a reasonably legendary trader whose name you've either heard or will hear again if you continue down the line of kind of studying and educating yyourself on financial markets. His name is Richard Wyckoff, and some of you probably might have heard of like the Wyckoff cycle, I think it's called, or maybe just seen his name in books or somewhere else. But uh, these laws are pretty much directly taken from him. First one is supply and demand. And as a note, these rules are pretty simple, but they're very applicable to financial markets. So uh, here's kind of the first law, supply and demand. When demand is greater than supply, price will rise. And when supply is greater than demand, price will fall. So demand is people wanting something, right? If I'm in demand for something, I want a product or a service or an asset in this case. And supply is people willing to provide a product or a service or an asset. So for example, if I'm a supplier of two by fours and there's a whole bunch of suppliers of two by fours and not many people trying to buy two by fours, well, the price of two by fours will probably go down. Or if I'm coming out of COVID and there's not many people providing two by fours, but a lot of people want to build homes, well, the price of two by fours will probably go up. So I have a couple examples of those sorts of scenarios. The first one is um, kind of how this supply and demand concept is reflected in the oil and gas ETF. So um, here we can see uh, I have the arrow pointed at March 2020. What could have possibly happened in March of or April 2020, causing a 75% drop in the oil and gas ETF, which represents the price of oil and gas, right? Does anybody have any guesses as to why this ETF probably dropped so significantly? Right. I mean, Spike already said it, right? Yeah, COVID, lockdowns, right? And ultimately, right, COVID and lockdowns and that sort of thing caused a decrease of demand because I guarantee you, a lot of you probably weren't driving during COVID. And as a result, the price of gas dropped very significantly, right? It's pretty pretty basic economics at the end of the day, but these sorts of things are reflected in price charts all over the place. And obviously, as the economy and world returned to normal, price moved higher in terms of oil and gas prices because now we're back to normal and some people are driving even more than they did before because they got remote work jobs, they had to go back to the office, whatever, right? So financial markets are ultimately driven by supply and demand. Remember that. One more example, uh, I found this example of this Rolex price, um, which I, I, if I'm correct, uh, this specific model of Rolex is no longer being manufactured. And if you guys are watch enthusiasts, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's the case. This model Rolex is no longer being made. So as a result, supply is fixed, right? So demand doesn't really need to go up in order for price to move higher because supply is not changing. So even if a couple more people want to buy this watch, they're probably going to have to pay more for it, right? Because they're not making any more of these watches. So this concept is reflected all over um, marketplaces, right? It's not just a mark. It's not just a trading thing. It's not just a commodity thing, right? Hawkinson says crypto, right? Absolutely. Um, one example that I always like to give is PS4s, right? Or the resale market, right? For example, if you want to buy the new Jordans, there's only a sad amount of Jordans available. So at least I think that's how it works. I don't, I don't really know, to be honest, but anyway, yeah, Aaron, exactly. This is effectively economics 101, right? If demand outpaces supply, well, prices go up. If supply outpaces demand, prices go down. And we're going to talk about how do you find that sort of indication in financial markets based on volume price analysis. All right. Next rule is cause and effect. So we have supply and demand now moving on to cause and effect. 
A small amount of volume activity will only result in a small reaction in price. Conversely, a large amount of volume activity will generally result in a large reaction in price. Now, volume is the cause, price is the effect. So as we see more volume, more volume show up, whether it's buyers or sellers, we generally see that reflected in price, right? So volume is, I guess it's kind of a chicken and egg situation, right? Typically volume is actually what drives the moves in price. So as buyers and sellers step into the marketplace, price moves in order to meet the adjusted supply and demand of those new buyers and sellers. So really important to note, volume is the cause, price is the effect. And we can see this reflected uh, in a couple of different things, right? Tesla is, you know, a really, really good example. Uh, taking a look at this, right? We have the largest buy volume in an entire year, right? So here's the cause. And yeah, Helmi, great question. And here we are, right? So at the bottom here, we have the volume subgraph shown. So you could see the buy and sell volume for Tesla for an entire year. And all of a sudden, we got the largest buy volume in an entire year, right? So over the period of an entire year, for some reason, the most buyers showed up on this day, right? For, for some reason, right? Then ultimately price consolidated for a little bit and price moved significantly higher. And one thing to be mindful of as we continue to go throughout these lectures is that smart money is always going to be buying at the right time and selling at the right time. And you can see very clearly they bought before the rip and Tesla's even higher now. It's at what, 260? And you know, obviously this is a little bit of a cherry picked example, right? It's Tesla, this is a pretty aggressive move, um, but this concept is still incredibly applicable. And these are the sorts of things you wanna be looking for. So again, right, we have this largest buy volume in an entire year, a little bit of consolidation and no surprise, right? We could even chart this out, check this out on the daily and clean this up. No surprise, once we broke this pivot higher, we got a massive move, right? 35% in eight days. That's, I mean, it's not unheard of for Tesla, but it's it's pretty unheard of, right? This is pretty significant um, for a stock that's a $500 billion stock. Uh, volume is not all buyers, right? Yeah, that's a good question, Rafael. So yeah, obviously in this case, right, this volume represents what happened in the entire day. And the volume here is painted based on the color of the candle. So for example, what I mean by that is if it's a bull bar, where the open is lower than the close, meaning price appreciated throughout the day, generally by default, the volume bar is going to be colored green, right? But yes, you're correct, right? In order to have um, buying volume, you have to actually have selling volume, right? Because shares don't just appear out of nowhere. Somebody has to sell you those shares in order for you to buy them. So yeah, there's always gonna be selling volume in order to meet those demands of the buyers. However, at the end of the day, right? That demand imbalance between buyers and sellers is what causes price to appreciate throughout the day, right? Because if buyers and sellers were just perfectly matched, price would never go anywhere, right? If every buyer always had a seller, why would price move, right? Everybody's happy. Everybody has a buyer and seller, but the second somebody wants a little bit more money, that's when the balance starts to change. I got one more example here. Apple, right? Again, similar example where we have the largest buy volume in an entire year as price breaks prior all-time highs, right? Which you can see here. So prior all-time highs, right around this $190 area, right? So the largest buy volume in an entire year as price breaks prior all-time highs. And you could think about this in a different way, right? Imagine you saw, let's say for example, I don't know what PS4 is called or PS5, sorry. If a PS5 is being sold, you know, $250 MSRP. And all of a sudden you see people jumping through the door to pay $500, right? Which is $250 above MSRP. That's probably something to pay attention to, right? It's like, well, why are they doing that? Why do they want the PS5 so bad, right? And in that specific example, those people are probably just a little bit dumb, right? They're not patient. However, in financial markets, people who have enough money to buy enough shares to create the largest buy volume in an entire year aren't dumb, right? Dumb people don't typically have billions and billions of dollars. Now, obviously there's always gonna be an exception, but for the most part, right? Smart money is what creates these high volume days. And as a result, that's why we're so focused on them, right? That's why it's important for us to pay attention to them. What's up, Flips? Welcome in, everybody's favorite. What up, my dude, how are you? I'm good, dude, we're, we're going, we're getting deep into volume price analysis. This is a fun one so far. Yeah, I like volume. I know. 
<laughs> if you have anything to add at all while we go through, feel free to just start interrupting me. No, man, I'm good. I'm I'm here to learn. I'm here to learn. I'm I'm listening. All right. All right. Cool. So yes, this is the fundamental idea and application of the cause and effect rule, right? And obviously, as you can see, and probably are familiar with by now, after that largest buy volume in a day, Apple continued to move higher, right? And <laughs> pretty funny enough, we also later had the largest sell volume in a year, but price didn't move lower, which that's a totally separate concept called a volume price analysis or volume or volume anomaly, I guess we'll call it. So anyway, um, that's the big idea behind cause and effect. The last idea that I want to introduce is effort versus result. And this is one I think from, I think it's Isaac Newton uh, who really coined this term as it relates to physics. However, it actually also applies to markets, uh, which is every action must have an equal and opposite reaction. So as a result, how that applies to markets is high volume generally should equal a large change in price, where low volume generally should equal small or no change in price. And as I just mentioned a little bit ago, the above scenarios don't always occur, which would be a volume price analysis anomaly. So for example, if we have really high volume and don't go anywhere, that's kind of something to pay attention to. And a great example of that recently is crowd, right? CRWD. Um, we had really high volume here, right? The highest volume in, I don't know how long. I mean, if we zoom out a couple of years, the highest volume in at least three years on this specific day, but price didn't really go anywhere. That doesn't necessarily mean that price is going to move higher. However, it definitely means that somebody is either unloading or adding a very significant position. And it's up to us to use the clues that price gives us and react to how price changes in order to actually react to that, which as it has panned out so far, looks like we're actually ended up breaking down. So anyway, that's one application there. So a couple examples of effort versus result, right? Here, for example, as Mara back in, I think, uh, mid-October broke prior 52-week highs on the heaviest volume in a year uh, to gap up, right? This is a pretty big deal, right? So this is the volume bar that I'm referring to here. We have the highest volume that we've had in an entire year with a massive gap up and also a bull bar closing near its high, right? That's going to be an example of volume validating price. We got a big move higher and we got volume to support it. So what's the summary, right? It's three words, volume validates price. If we are looking for a strong breakout, we need to see that volume come in as price breaks out. If we're looking for a hold of support, we need to see that volume come in as price comes into that support. And we can react to those changes in volume, right? That's why it's so important to have this understanding of volume because if you don't, you're kind of blind in some senses. So volume validates price. If you don't remember anything from this lecture and you give up on the lecture series after today, which that would be sad, but maybe you didn't like me or whatever, remember this, volume validates price. Without volume, it doesn't really matter what price does, right? Because for example, that's like, I'm trying to think of what that what, what a good analogy for that is. But for example, if we make a massive move in price on no volume, doesn't really matter, right? But you'll notice every time we make a massive move in price on volume, it typically matters. Like for example, Nvidia gapping up uh, over 10% on a positive earnings report. Lo and behold, it mattered, right? Price almost 50% one at, or 1.5X in a couple weeks after that gap up, right? And for example, Tesla, right? Massive breakout on really high volume, right? That mattered, right? We're still moving higher. Apple, same story. Um, you, I mean, you could see this all over the place. There are so many examples of this, especially recently. Over and over again, we see the same concept where when we get a strong breakout backed by volume, price always follows. Volume is one of the only leading indicators in markets. And volume is where big money can't hide, right? Volume or big money can use a bunch of different mechanisms to hide their trades from the open market, whether it's in the dark pools or after hours or pre-market, but volume is the one indicator that is always true to what is going on. You can literally never hide the amount of volume. And obviously there's always gonna be some way that somebody knows, but <laughs> for the purpose of this lecture, volume always tells us what is actually going on under the hood. And if we don't get a move with volume, we know it's time to be cautious. 
Lion Trader, is there something on TOS where we can see the average daily, weekly, and monthly volume to determine if it's higher or lower than normal? The answer is yes. Um, there's a couple different indicators that I use. Um, one that I really like, uh, let's see if it's included here. Uh, you can see here, I kind of custom made this indicator. Uh, this, you can see it paints the volume bars uh, yellow. Uh, and when the volume bars are yellow, that tells me that volume is three standard deviations above the mean. And those of you with a statistics background should know that something that's three standard deviations above the mean means it has about a 1% chance of, uh, I'll say the frequency of something occurring three standard deviations away from the mean is about 1% in each direction, right? So I'm gonna refrain from going into the detailed uh, statistical analysis. Well, it's not really that complicated, but I'm going to refrain from talking any more in depth about that. But essentially, I have this indicator that I have shared in my tab. It's pinned in there. That shows when volume is uniquely high. And notice, right, let's just zoom in to the last time's volume's been high. Here, right, check this out. Really high volume with a tiny, tiny candlestick, right? That'd be an anomaly, right? The cause is massive, right? Massive, massive a cause, right? Super high volume with no effect, right? A bunch of volume and nothing happened. Generally, that's a reason for us to say, okay, what's going on here, right? Something's wrong. Here, above average volume as price breaks down, right? Significant gap down. So that makes sense. Price continued lower. Here, significant gap higher. Price continued higher. Well, that makes sense, right? Here, significant bottom forming. Price moved higher after that, right? Well, that makes sense. Here, really significant volume and no move in price. Well, that's a reason for us to say, okay, what's going on here, right? We probably wanna trade the levels after that. A Little bit of high volume as we trade in this base, right? What that shows is institutions likely accumulating a position as price remains in a range. Again, we could go on and on every single one of these examples, right? Here, significant volume, price moved higher. Here, significant volume on what looks like a nice hammer off a key level, right? Price ended up moving higher. Here, significant volume, this is the day before their event. so. That's kind of a bit of an anomaly, right? The day volume, the day before any event, there's always going to be high volume. So that can't care about too much, I guess. Um, anyway, that's the big idea behind why that above average volume is so significant and can be so powerful. We got another question from Rafael. Let's say you would stop if it breaks below VLOP. If it breaks below with lower volume than average, would that be valid to wait for an X candle then before stopping? Yeah, absolutely. And obviously it depends on the type of trade you're in. Like if you're in, you know, a same day and you're doing that, um, you could definitely start to get in the position where you're holding and hoping, right? So you, you got to be a little bit conscious of what you're doing there. Um, but the short answer is yes. If, if something does something on lower volume, it's absolutely a reason to take a step back and just be a little bit patient. Wait for that volume to come in. And yeah, I mean, you'll see flips do this literally every day in BC. I mean, this is all flips is doing pretty much. It's, I mean, that's all he really uses as far as I'm aware. So anyway, yeah, vol no volume, no movement flips. There you go. Without any volume, usually not much is going to happen, right? There's always times though when you can get movement um, with with volume. So anyway, or without volume, but we're not going to go too far down that road right now. Uh, this series will be recorded and it probably will interfere with the mastermind schedule, but hopefully we can get you guys to do, well, actually I forgot the mastermind is going to be pretty, pretty taxing, but we'll see. It'll be recorded. So we'll, we'll figure it out. All right. Let's talk a little bit about the basics of volume, right? So this is really going to be kind of the funnel into our next class. So um, I know we haven't really talked about it in too much detail, but volume represents the amount of shares traded or exchanged in a given time frame. So here at the bottom, you can see the volume bars, and this is the weekly time frame. So each one of these candles and each one of these volume bars represents one week of trading activity. Additionally, volume helps us quantify the amount of buyers and sellers in the marketplace. So for example, all these examples are days where buyers were in control, and this reflects buying volume, right, for the most part, right? In any day, obviously, as we mentioned, there's always going to be some sellers, but these specific bars represent days where buyers were in control and they seem to have above average volume, where these days represent where sellers are in control, right? We have that above average, oops, that's a funny graphic. We have this above average selling volume. I know I just booted those two um, slides, but I'm gonna keep going on the next one then stop for questions. <laughs> I was gonna put like pictures of like Dirty River and flips on this, but I, I didn't have enough time. Uh, at the end of the day, buyers and sellers are playing a constant tug of war with price. Buyers on one hand are looking for price to move higher, right? 
when they buy and give an asset, the idea is for price to move up, Tough, plain and simple. Where sellers, when they sell an asset, the idea is either they're going short, so they should be expecting price to move lower, or they're selling because they think this is a good price and they think price will go lower. So at the end of the day, buyers and sellers are constantly playing this battle where they're fighting with each other for the right price, they're fighting for who's in control, and it really is a game of constant tug of war. And that constant tug of war is reflected in the price chart, right, where we can see when areas finds places of balance. Uh, that's represented as consolidation. So here, for example, buyers and sellers were in pretty much agreement on what the price should be, right? Their price sat in a range. Here, buyers and sellers were pretty much in agreement on what price should be, right? Price sat in a range. When price trends, buyers and sellers are not in agreement, right? So one party thinks they need to be buying when the other party thinks they should be selling, right? Where we get these trends, right? So trends represent imbalances between buyers and sellers. Ranges represent balance between buyers and sellers. And everybody should be familiar with the fact that Ranges are not typically the place to be super aggressive, right? Ranges are wait are places to wait for the extremes of the range to come into play and wait for the breakout, right? Because buyers and sellers are really figuring out what they want to do, right? At the end of the day, uh, one analogy that I really liked, I think this was from the book, was you could think of buyers and sellers and just traders in general like big companies, right? Because at the end of the day, they are big companies. And these big companies load and unload their inventories or their warehouses with inventories of different shares, right? And you can think of warehouses, where warehouses, their portfolio. And generally, the best, smartest, and wealthiest trading firms are going to be loading their inventories with shares at what they think is the best price. And what we can do in order to determine when that's happening is look for these high volume spikes as price sits in a range. And once we get that break of the range, we know that the accumulation has been completed Big money has gotten their position, and now they're ready to start moving price. And remember, at the end of the day, big money is in control of financial markets, period, point blank, right? People like you and I have no control. We have no impact. And people that think that big money firms are out to get the little traders, I personally think are not – I don't think that's a very good opinion, right? Because – they're just going to go for each other. <laughs> we have a fraction of the money in financial markets. It's The market isn't manipulated against you. It's That's just how it works. Deal with it, right? End of story. Learn it. So that's a big idea. Uh, do we have any questions on kind of the basics of volume or anything we covered in this class? We're a little bit under time, so we're moving a little bit quicker than I expected. But um, how are we feeling so far? That is a huge self-esteem that definitely have an ego if you think institutions are hunting you. Yeah, institutions could care less uh, what you're doing. It, for the most part, it really, uh, really doesn't matter. All right. And how are we liking the lecture? I mean, again, you guys can give me your honest feedback. I, again, I've never given this class before. I've never shown anybody this presentation before. So if you guys have any feedback, ways to improve it, feel free to let me know. Uh, I'm sure this won't be the last time we give this class. So if you guys have any things that you maybe would like better, um, go ahead and let me know. Super open to feedback. I actually typically prefer um, negative feedback. <laughs> that's funny, Tim. Yeah, I guess that's a good point. <laughs> yeah, I, I just looked up tug of war on Google and this this was what I found. So, <laughs> so this, is the, this is the best I could get. Uh, Marina, that's a good question. Um, so uh, what does it mean when we see low volume in big candles? Yeah, interesting question. Um, so that is defined as a volume price anomaly. Uh, and what it means when we see low volume and big candles is that we had a big change on low volume. So it's probably best for us to just take a step back and wait, right? If price is moving significantly higher on low volume, it's not necessarily a good or bad thing. We really just need to take a step back, wait for the next couple bars and see what's actually going on. Um, so typically when we see those sorts of anomalies, it's a good time for you to just take a quick step back um, and wait for the next uh, high volume move, essentially. Um, Gail says, should we look at, should we only look at the five minute candle open and close uh, before entering and exiting based upon volume? So yeah, good question. Uh, like we mentioned at the beginning of the class, um, the kind of idea of following volume and the idea of understanding patterns and volumes applies to every single time frame. So it's not just a five minute thing. It's not just an hourly thing. It's not just a daily thing. Every time frame, every equity. That said, though, uh, some uh, sometimes, right, depending on how you're trading, yeah, that's going to be the time frame you're looking at. Like if you're scalping, 
yeah, you'll probably be paying it more attention to the five minute than the daily, right? Uh, if you're a swing trader, a little bit more like me, where you're holding over multiple days, um, you're probably a bit more concerned about the higher time frames, right? The daily, the hourly, that sort of thing. Um, but as a scalper, right, you're in and out of a trade and maybe the period of five minutes. So yeah, only caring about the uh, five minute in that specific scenario would be fine. Um, for example, if even if you're up 10%, there's no volume, you won't be filled. There's it no volume is just not making percent moves. So yeah, it's a, a little bit of a careful kind of scenario to get yourself in there. So um, just because volume is low doesn't necessarily mean that you won't get filled. Um, part of the responsibility of what's called market makers is to facilitate trading activity. So to be able to provide that liquidity if people need it. Um, so just because there's low volume doesn't necessarily mean that you won't be able to trade. However, low volume means that people who are more important than you aren't trading. So that's really what's most important there. Um, volume spikes help determine important levels since that's where big money believes they should buy or sell. Absolutely, Aaron. And we're going to continue to talk about those ideas in the next lectures. I want to refrain from getting too deep into those concepts today. And you'll notice that's kind of why I strayed away from the topic. Um, but yes, Aaron, that is absolutely it. And that's why volume price analysis is so powerful is because at the end of the day, it gives us the insight we need to determine what big money is doing, right? We're looking at volume, we're looking at price, and we're able to validate what's actually going on under the hood, which is so important and really adds the quality of the trades that you take. Shout out volume shelf. Yeah, shout out volume shelf too. I don't know. I, I guess maybe we should talk about that as part of this, which we probably will in lecture four. Um, but yeah, I don't know if you've been in my lectures before, Aaron. Um, but yeah, volume, vo the volume profile, volume shelf, market profile, whatever you want to call it. Um, that's uh, definitely a staple uh, in my tool belt. There's uh, no denying that. Uh, Fred, how can you watch the beginning of this lecture? It's going to be uploaded to the Discord. Uh, so it's going to be posted in the latest classes tab uh, down here. So it's going to be posted down here at some point, hopefully in the next couple of days. All right, so I wanna go through and summarize what we've covered today uh, and just remind everybody what's next in the class. So in summary, we introduced uh, VPA and the related background. background. We discussed the laws of volume price analysis and begun explaining the basics of volume. In the next few lectures, we have a lot more to cover and it's only gonna get more difficult and more detailed. So um, this class hopefully felt like the easiest one, uh, well, will feel like the easiest one as it relates to the rest of these classes, um, but, Coming up in two weeks, because um, I'm skipping lecture next week, uh, and then going to do two in a single week, we're going to talk about foundations of volume price analysis. Then after that, we're going to talk about the applications of volume price analysis. So we have a lot, really the meat and potatoes coming up in the next two lectures. This was really just getting us all on the same page, getting you to understand the significance and the importance of these classes, um, and really why you should be here. Um, so with that said, that really wraps up the content that I planned on covering today. A uh, little bit under an hour, so apologies for that. Um, hopefully, maybe you guys have something else to do tonight. But um, yeah, I just want to say thank you guys so much for attending. I'm going to stick around for a little bit for uh, any comments, questions, or any unrelated things that we want to talk about with the rest of our time. Um, but that's really the end of it. So before everybody starts leaving, I want to just ask, what do you guys think? Are you guys going to be coming to the rest of the lectures or at least watching them? This idea makes sense. I know, again, we still have a lot to get into, but I can promise you, I guarantee, I told you at the beginning of this lecture, or at least in the announcement, I told you I'd guarantee you'd learn something, which if you didn't learn something, I'm impressed, honestly, because I learned something doing research for this class. And I guarantee you will continue to learn new things, new systems for your trading in the next couple classes. And me personally, these concepts were are foundational. They're so, so key. And they're just in addition to how I already trade. So yeah, I'm, I'm happy to hear you guys are excited. I really hope to see you guys all in the next couple ones. Um, it's it's going to be a fun one. Um, yeah, there's going to be a lot more to cover for sure. Um, hopefully it doesn't get too boring. I got all the images ready to go. They're directly from the book. So we're going to be talking about some more of these images, all the graphics. We're going to be um, really getting into the nitty gritty. So I guess here's a little bit of a spoiler, right? Some of the concepts that we talked about. Um, yeah, here's a spoiler that volume price analysis again, or volume price anomaly where we have a widespread below average volume, another anomaly where we have the narrow spread above average volume. So a lot more graphics to cover here. Um, yeah, this is all going to be, um, part of the fun. So, uh, I'm really excited for the next couple classes. This is one of the things that I'm most passionate about is a specific topic. Um, yeah. So 
Um, I yeah, I can upload those images. I'll I'll what I'll probably end up doing eventually is uploading the PD or the PowerPoints themselves. Um, so you guys can just go through the PowerPoints. All right. Well, thank you guys all so much for being here. Uh, if you guys have any questions, comments, concerns about what we talked about today, you know where to find me. Yeah, put out the calendar. I'll do that tonight. I'll get with Archon and we'll figure out the calendar. Uh, I'll actually send them a message right now before I even end the class. Can we figure out a calendar for my lecture series tonight? All right, I sent them the message right now. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna get it all on the schedule tonight and make sure it's all ready to go. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Appreciate you guys' attendance. This was our biggest class uh, in a long time. So happy to see you guys are all as excited as we are. Um, and we'll see you on the next one. Have a great rest of your night, everybody. Really excited for the next rest of this series and uh, hope you guys are too. Thanks so much. You know where to find me for questions or comments. See ya.